Colleagues, friends of Challenges Forum, welcome wherever you are to the first Challenges Annual Forum uh, being virtual and it's titled Framing Peace Operations in a Changing Global Landscape. Challenges Forum has turned 24 years of age as an innovative multilateral platform for dialogue. We aim through our global partnership to help shape the debate for more effective peace operations, spanning from political and peace building missions to complex peacekeeping operations. My name is Bjorn Holmberg. I'm director of the Challenges Forum International Secretariat, and I will guide you and the speakers here today. For you seeing this session through Whova, our social platform for conference, I can recommend that you maximize the window. And if you would like to see all speakers in a gallery view, please open the separate link in the agenda to see the full transmission in Zoom. Having said so, I am very happy to introduce Sven Erik Söder, Director General of Folke Bernhardt Academy. Please, Sven Erik, join us. Welcome. You're also chair of the Challenges Forum International Steering Committee, representing our global partnership. So we're especially uh, happy to have you on board in that role. I'm also delighted to have Sean Pierre Lacra honoring us with his presence. So please, Sean Pierre, join us. You are Under Secretary General uh, at the UN Department of Peace Operations and one of the leading actors on implementing the Secretary General's Action for Peacekeeping. So delighted to have you both on board. Um, having said so, uh, let's go to our next item, which is the formal opening. So I'm pleased to ask you, Sven Erik, to welcome the participants of our global gathering. The screen is yours. Thank you very much, Bjorn. And uh, as I said, just the chairperson of the steering committee of the Challenges Forum, it's uh, my pleasure to wish you all very welcome to this live stream public official opening session of the Virtual Challenges Annual Forum 2020. And the theme for the annual forum this year is, as you know, framing peace operations in a changing global landscape. This year is our annual forum co-hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Indonesia, the Institute for Security Studies in South Africa, and the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. So on behalf of the Challenges Forum, I would really like to thank you all for your support and for your contribution and for hosting our annual forum uh, this year. I think it goes without saying that we are gathering this year in a very, very special time. Uh, and we are not only suffering from a worldwide pandemic, our multilateral cooperation and also I would say institutions are also contested. And the COVID-19 pandemic has also further hampered, of course, our space for diplomacy and dialogue. And also I would say accelerated a trend of polarization and fragmentation in world politics. But having said that, I think it's also important to, to see that uh, both the United Nations and also the different regional organizations all over the world is working very, very hard to, to handle and to tackle this uh, challenging uh, time we are living in. But uh, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that uh, the picture is a little bit gloomy anyway. And despite the UN Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire earlier this year, I think it was in March, we are still witnessing an increase in tensions in some parts of the world. And also more recently, we have also got new and also, as we can say, new old conflicts like the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. And we have also the recent conflict in Tigray region in Ethiopia. So we have really, really many challenges in front of us. And uh, on top of that, uh, we are also in the global economic recession, a recession that is uh, undoing, I think, decades of peace and development dividends. And to uh, refer to the IMF, uh, Despite that we can see a global rebound next year of plus 5% in terms of GDP, uh, we are still having severe economic problems. Uh, I heard that uh, the head of the UN World Food Program addressed the 
General Assembly uh, last, last week. And according to the predictions from the World Food Programme, next year, 2021, can be the worst humanitarian crisis year that we ever have had since the United Nations was, was founded. And uh, the head of the UN World Food Pro Programme, Mr. Beasley, he said that famine is knocking on the door to a dozen of countries. And the number of people living in extreme poverty is also unfortunately expected to increase for the first time in 20 years. And the UN estimates that 235 million people will be in need of humanitarian aid next year. It's an increase of almost 40% compared to this, this year. And uh, the increase is almost exclusively due to COVID-19. And as we all know, um, economic and social inequality and marginalization are in fact important driving forces for conflict. Uh, so I think we can't exclude that we're going to see further more conflicts and violence as a logical consequence of the situation we are living in. And uh, so the need for uh, 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 efficient peace operations is really, really great. With the overarching theme framing peace operations in the changing global landscape, the 2020 Challenges Annual Forum has the ambition to be a platform for reflections on how to develop and also sustain effective peace operations in the changing global uh, context. And uh, I think for all of us gathering here today, I think our message is, is clear. We need more multilateralism, not less, and we need more of international cooperation, uh, not less. And we really do hope that the annual forum will bring us many opportunities to informal reflections that can contribute to a stronger and better uh, international uh, cooperation. So my friends, um, friends of the Challenges Forum, with these words, I would like once again to wish you all warmly welcome to the Virtual Challenges Annual Forum 2020. And it's now my pleasure to hand over again to the director of the Challenges Forum, Dr. Björn Holmberg. Please, Björn. Thank you very much, Sven Erik. And in spite of all the challenges that you outlined for us, I think the words uh, ringing in my ear is the need for more multilateralism and to use the tool for peace and security and development available. And, and that's very much the task of us as an informal platform to promote this. Um, so thanks for contributing and helping us frame the coming days, Sven Erik. And uh, before I'm going to ask uh, both of you, Jean-Pierre and Sven Erik, some questions, uh, I am very happy to welcome a message from Her Excellency, Mrs. Ine Eriksson Sureide, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, I welcome the opportunity to address the 2020 Challenges Annual Forum. This is indeed a time of change in the global landscape and the pandemic comes on top of increasingly complex challenges that are facing most UN operations. Norway is strongly committed to ensuring that these operations can uphold their role as effective tools in advancing international peace and security. And I will make four points in that regard. First, Norway fully agrees with the focus of the Secretary General's action for peacekeeping. Support to political processes must be at the heart of all peace operations. Lack of genuine political will remains a key impediment to lasting peace in countries in conflict. Second, increased cooperation with the African Union, regional organizations and ad hoc arrangements will be crucial to the future success of UN peace operations in Africa. A key lesson from the Sahel, where the UN is engaged together with the AU, the G5 Sahel and others, is that coordination is vital and that it must include humanitarian and development actors. I trust that NUPI and ISS will provide valuable insight on these issues. We know them as very competent partners in Norway's engagement in support for peace and security in Africa. And third, we must find a way to ensure greater predictability with regard to the financing of transitions. And this includes adequate funding for special political missions that often take over when peacekeeping missions withdraw. 
but it also includes funding for peace-building activities that no longer benefit from assessed contributions. We all stand to lose if there is a relapse to conflict. Fourth and finally, efforts must continue to promote the equal and meaningful participation of women as peacekeepers. It's equally important that mission personnel engage fully with women as well as men from the host country when implementing the mandate. In that regard, I would like to applaud Indonesia for having tabled the first ever resolution on women and peacekeeping. I wish you luck in your endeavors over the next few days. We will be studying your recommendations, looking for input that we can use during our tenure on the UN Security Council. Um, and with that message, I think you heard a lot of uh, key issues being raised, but I would like to highlight what the Foreign Minister Ine Eriksson Sereide said about agreeing with the UN Secretary General that the political process of peace operations must be at the heart of each of the missions. So having said that, Jean-Pierre, I'd like to ask you, uh, how can we ensure political support, support for peace operations as an effective tool to advance international peace and security? Especially so, and thinking of what Sven Erik said, in the context of hampered space for dialogue and an accelerated trend of polarization and fragmentation in the world. Would you like to start? And uh, would love to hear your thoughts on this topic, Jean Pierre. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Bjorn, and uh, um, good, uh, good, good afternoon, uh, um, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you, Sven Erik. Um, and um, the uh, Minister Sereide actually uh, uh, was uh, spot on uh, when she highlighted uh, uh, a number of topics on, on, on which uh, I wanted also to, to, to put some focus on. I mean, clearly, um, the uh, all political, all, all peace operations have ultimately a political mandate. And I, that, I think it's important to highlight it, to emphasize this. Uh, even if we're only talking about uh, people in uniform monitoring and ceasefire, ultimately it's always about uh, creating better condition for political solution to be achieved. But then the problem is um, we need uh, all efforts uh, to be made uh, in a very sustained and, and, and committed manner so that these political solution can be taken forward. The problem today is that uh, uh, we uh, very often don't have enough of that commitment. Uh, and what we need is, uh, first of all, uh, stronger support and engagement from our stakeholders, uh, the member states, the Security Council. It's not only about uh, extending our mandates, it's also about uh, having the support from the Security Council uh, on our political efforts. And it's also about uh, having support from other bodies, a General Assembly that uh, provides uh, our finance and, and so on and so forth. I also believe that uh, uh, we need uh, to build on partnerships. Um, today, uh, it is even more clear than ever than um, the UN or a peace operation uh, although it can be an important tool uh, to support political efforts, but uh, nothing can be done only by a, uh, by a sole peace operation or by the UN only. We need to build on partnership. This is what we're doing with the African Union, with regional sub-region organization, uh, with the uh, European Union, and uh, and and these kind of uh, joint efforts and, and re, if you will, uh, uh, um, coalition of, uh, uh, of those uh, who have a stake and who are willing to be engaged uh, are uh, very often much more effective when it comes to uh, taking uh, forward uh, political efforts. Um, and uh, perhaps a last point uh, on uh, the, um, uh, from a different angle, on uh, political support to, uh, to peace operation. Um, we also need to continue our efforts to improve the impact and the, and the, the effectiveness of peace operation, because this is also the way in which we can uh, gain uh, more credibility and therefore uh, potentially more support uh, to our actions. Uh, so this is also uh, a very important part of uh, uh, gaining credibility and uh, enhancing support. But the long and the short is that uh, 
uh, we uh, uh, insist on the primacy of politics on peace operation. Uh, uh, we uh, will continue our efforts to uh, improve uh, all areas really relevant to performance, but ultimately uh, the way out, uh, the condition for success is a stronger engagement on the political front. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, and I, I do very much appreciate your clarity of, of the effectiveness of peace operations also as a motivator and the issue about partnership also being seen as, as coalitions. Uh, and I don't know, Sven-Erik, what, what are your thoughts on, on this, uh, this dilemma, this, this difficulty we have now when we know that primaries of politics is, is a core issue? Well, um, I think I can add uh, four very brief uh, comments on, on this subject. Um, and first, I think it's important to keep in mind that most of the conflicts in the world cannot be solved by force, although force can be, uh, be an asset uh, during some circumstances. And if we have the understanding that we need political solutions, it is also much easier to get the conclusion to the conclusion that uh, uh, we have the primacy of politics. So on that point, of course, I fully uh, agree with, uh, with, with Jean-Pierre. Uh, so that is my uh, point of departure. I think it is important to understand that uh, uh, we have to work for political uh, solutions. My second point is on the need of uh, patience. And uh, I think if we take a look into the UN system, in many respects, we do have the tools already in the toolbox. We have an ongoing uh, reform process on peace and security. This is called Peace and Security Pillar. We have the Action for Peacekeeping report from uh, the Secretary General. So uh, I think in reality, we, need, we, we know what is needed to, to be done. So it's important to try to deliver on decisions already taken. That is my, my second uh, point. My third point is on uh, the importance of bringing all stakeholders on board. Of course, it will take time to do that, but if we are heading for political solutions, it is really, really crucial and important to have all stakeholders on board. And then you have to uh, take the time that is needed to, uh, to achieve that. And uh, my fourth point is very much in line with what uh, Jean-Pierre said. Uh, in order to, to reach good political uh, uh, solutions, it is also essential to have a, a, a good working climate between the UN and the different regional organizations in different parts uh, of the world. So that would be my, my take on the, the importance of uh, the primacy of, of politics. Thank you very much, Jan Erik. And, and I think you saying that the tools are there, it's possibly a question about patience is, is something we need to bring. But also a challenge I've seen myself since 9-11 in 2001 is that with the increasing tensions globally and terrorism, we, we sometimes have peace process where not everyone is on board. And then, of course, it's a question of can they be on board? And secondly, uh, is a sustainable peace possible without them? And what is the price? So a lot of issues could be raised, of course, in the coming days of, of dialogue on, on this topic. Uh, thanks to both of you, and, and I would like to add a second reflection and welcome uh, a message from Her Excellency Retno Marsuri, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, over the past few months, the pandemic has further complicated peacekeepers' work on the ground. Aside from their mandates, peacekeepers have been tasked to support host countries in containing the pandemic. At the same time, by early November, COVID-19 has infected 1,255 peacekeepers and killed 11. There are only a glimpse of increasingly hostile mission environments. Even without the pandemic, peacekeeping is a dangerous job. The threat of violence is ever present. In some mission, terrorism and asymmetric warfare await our peacekeepers. We must ensure 
UN peacekeeping is responsive to this changing landscape. After all, all peacekeeping is a collective undertaking with shared responsibility. The key word here is partnership, especially in three areas. First, ensuring better support for UN peacekeeping. Peacekeepers can only effectively discharge their mandates when they are well equipped and supported both politically and financially. This issue is particularly relevant amidst growing expectation for peacekeepers and increased scrutiny on their performance. Despite the 22% UN cut back for peacekeepers cost since 2006, Indonesian peacekeepers continue to maintain the highest level of professionalism. But this does not mean justification in asking peacekeepers to do more with less. All peacekeeping mandate must be fully resourced. This is key in sustaining long-term TPCC's contributions. Equally important is the health of the peacekeepers. Since 2011, illness has been the leading cause of peacekeepers' death. We must ensure our peacekeepers receive proper health care. Second, deploying well-trained peacekeepers. This means preparing our peacekeepers to better perform their duties whilst guaranteeing their safety and security. Training needs must be identified together with TPCCs based on the mission specific mandates and situation on the ground. Indonesia is committed to provide training for peacekeepers from the region and beyond through partnership with the UN, other TPCs, donor countries, and civil societies. We take pride in supporting Triangular Partnership Initiative, which has trained more than 4,600 uniformed personnel. Partnership is also required to enhance peacekeeping capacity of regional organizations, such as ASEAN and the African Union. Third, advancing the role of women in peacekeeping. Indonesia is a strong advocate of women as agent of peace. Last August, we initiated the first ever standalone Security Council resolution on women in peacekeeping. This reflects our commitment to promote greater participation of women in peacekeeping at all levels and in all positions. To achieve this, we must expand the pool of women peacekeepers, strengthen their capacity, and make nation's environment more attractive for women peacekeepers, including through gender-sensitive facilities we should identify specific mechanisms to deal with this issue at national level and the UN. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for peacekeeping to remain fit for purpose, it must be an integral part of the broader sustaining peace strategy. Peacekeeping must lay the groundwork for inclusive peace building. This requires integrated planning and consultation with all stakeholders. I do hope this meeting will reinforce partnership to strengthen our support for the Blue Helmets. I thank you very much. Uh, as you can hear, uh, the foreign ministry raises a number of, of essential issues and, and Indonesia has also been a member of the UN Security Council the past two years. Uh, and especially the foreign minister Retno Marsudi 
um, mentioned that under their presidency, as you will know, uh, Indonesia sponsored and uh, had the support to pass the UN Security Council resolution, the first one on women, peace and security and peacekeeping. Uh, and I would like to ask you first, uh, Sven Erik, uh, given the context you lay out in your introductory speech, uh, I wonder in this changing global context, uh, as we know that the WPS agenda has advanced a lot, but there's a long way to go, uh, how can political support for women, peace and security and peace operations be sustained, not just strengthened, but sustained? Uh, please, Sven Erik. Well, um, thank you, Bjorn. And let me first also applaud Indonesia for uh, putting forward this, uh, I would say, groundbreaking and very important uh, resolution. Very much appreciated. Uh, well, talking about uh, the broad women, peace and security agenda, I think it is important to understand that that agenda is a precondition for progress in general when we are talking about peace operations and peacekeeping operations. And another precondition for uh, taking this agenda forward is leadership, uh, I think. And uh, you can never ever uh, underestimate uh, or overestimate, sorry, overestimate the importance of, of, of leadership. And one conclusion we have drawn in our agency, the Folke Bandt Academy, is that it, we need to invest more work and resources in the leadership aspect of women, peace and security. So that's why we have developed um, a concept that we call gender responsive leadership, uh, a concept that will help leaders to address the important issues of uh, gender equality in their day-to-day -day work as leaders in, in different contexts, in peace operations, peacekeeping operations, and other contexts dealing with, uh, with, with, with peace. So uh, my conclusion is that uh, in order to take the important work of peace forward, we need to invest more in the women, peace and security agenda. But in order to be successful when doing that, we need to invest more in, in leadership because uh, without a well-functioning and modern leadership, we will not be able to uh, sustain or to strengthen the women, peace and security agenda. And, uh, this year, 2020, is a year of anniversary, as you all know. This groundbreaking resolution 1325 was adopted 20 years ago. And of course, we are moving in the right direction and we have achieved uh, a lot uh, during those uh, 20 years. But uh, 20 years is one fifth of, uh, of, of, a, of a century. And I think we need to have uh, uh, higher ambitions uh, when we are looking into the coming years. And it is really, really high time for, for actions uh, when we are talking about the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Thank you, Sven Erik. Jean Pierre, I'll give the screen to you on this topic of WPS and, and the challenges ahead and possibilities. Thank you. Um, well, there are two uh, dimensions that are complementary uh, when uh, we look at the WPS peacekeeping. One is uh, can the can continuous efforts to improve and increase the number of uh, women in, in peace operation. And uh, we see it as, a, as an issue of, of, of effectiveness uh, because we know that uh, we have more effective peace operations when we have more women in it. And uh, it's not only about, uh, as some uh, uh, would point out, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the better ability to engage with communities and build trust and, and prevent sexual uh, or gender-based violence, but it's also because our peace operations uh, must reflect the diversity of the communities in which we operate. Now, we have made progress. We have uh, uh, reached uh, our target. We, we have uh, actually gone beyond our targets when it, come to, uh, when it comes to the proportion of uh, female police officers and uh, uh, female women in, in foreign police units, uh, military observers, uh, staff officers. Uh, a little less when it comes to form military unit because uh, here the resource is uh, uh, still uh, a bit harder to get. Uh, we have more um, women in senior position 
in, in uh, uh, peacekeeping, I mean, close to 40% of the senior leadership of our peacekeeping operation are uh, women. Uh, but this is really important. And uh, in order to sustain the efforts, we, we need uh, to continue the advocacy with our member states. They are more receptive to that. They understand better that uh, they must uh, provide us uh, with the female candidates, with more women in the form units that they are providing to us. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the uh, other dimension of the WPS agenda is the uh, promotion of a greater involvement of women in political efforts, um, writ large and at the local and national level. And, and this is absolutely crucial if we are to build uh, peaceful solutions that are more sustainable, that are more durable because they would be more accepted uh, by communities, they would have a stronger buy-in. And here, uh, I think, um, you know, if you look at from the, uh, from the health uh, uh, full glass uh, type of approach, uh, the, you, you would say, I mean, there are certain progress. There are um, a number of mission settings, a host countries that have uh, um, now legal provisions to uh, secure a certain proportion of women in um, uh, decision-making bodies, both at the national and local level. We have the peace agreement, the Central African Republic. We have uh, uh, provisions to, to the effect of securing a certain proportion of women in, in uh, deliberative bodies in, in Mali and, and, and same in the South Sudan. Um, we are making a lot of efforts on the ground together with our colleagues to, uh, uh, to enhance uh, the involvement of women in, in political efforts, including by being uh, registered as voters, by being candidates uh, uh, for election. Uh, so that is the, uh, uh, the areas in which I would say there are some progress, but uh, there's much more that needs to be done because uh, in, in a number of cases, what we see is an in involvement of women that is uh, still too much on the margin, too superficial, not uh, uh, bringing women to the core of the decision making. And this is where we have uh, to put more emphasis again. Uh, this is an area where we need to work collectively with our partners. I think the African Union is now uh, also very much engaged in uh, supporting the WPS agenda and, and taking it forward. Uh, we have worked a lot with them, including by uh, having joint missions that involved on our side the UN women and on their side uh, the uh, women leadership uh, circle of uh, the African Union. But uh, this is something on which political push and, and including the push of the uh, Security Council and our uh, UN deliberative, deliberative bodies is, is very important. And, and finally, this is also an area where uh, in, in a number of, uh, uh, um, let's say, a rubric, in a number of uh, cases, uh, uh, we need to pay attention to financing and we need the support uh, of our uh, uh, constituency. I mean, those uh, who provide us uh, voluntary funding uh, uh, can usually make a huge difference by um, by uh, bringing financial resources to uh, uh, some of the key activities in in, in that regard. So. Uh, more to be done to ensure a real uh, uh, um, and, and meaningful and, and, and uh, you know, uh, um, actual participation in the core decision making uh, in political process. Uh, I think that is really where we have to make more efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. And I, I think just the fact that you both as senior leaders, male leaders, are raising that not enough, enough is done is in itself a very important political uh, signal. And, and when you say that there's a 40% increase of, of senior mission uh, leadership, of female leadership, Jean-Pierre, and you, Sven Erik, raised that uh, in the work of FBA, you, you speak about uh, gender responsive leadership. I, I would like to take the chance to say that the Partnership Challenges Forum will launch early next year, actually a guidance or it's a consideration study for senior mission leaders in UN peace operations, which has been ma uh, gender mainstreamed. 
uh, right, you know, thinking of these as aspects that you have raised, and, and several of our partners, including Indonesia and ISS, have been been instrumental in work making this this uh, this study. Of course, in collaboration with DPO uh, and you, Jean Pierre. And I think it's next for the next or third key message for us to comment upon, and that is, um, I would like to welcome them, Dr. Jackie Siliers who's chair of the board of the Institute for Security Studies, one of our three hosts this year. Good day. My name is Yaki Silia. I stepped down as head of the Institute for Security Studies in 2015, and I now head the program on African futures and innovation. I do long-term forecasting. I look at trends over time and look at where the future may be headed. If we look back over time, we see that the African economy was about 3% of the world economy in the 1960s. Today, Africa with a population of about 1.3 billion people is still about 3% of the global economy. And the story of one is one of increasing divergence. Things are improving in Africa, but they are improving more slowly than in the rest of the world. And on global averages, such as that on average levels of income or GDP per capita, Africa is falling further and further behind. It's like the jaws of a yawning crocodile. There's a growing divergence, almost every dimension of human development, when you compare Africa with the averages in the rest of the world. Things are improving in, in, the, in the continent, but they are improving more slowly than elsewhere. In 2020, COVID has hit Africa with a devastating blow. This year alone, we estimate that about 16 million additional Africans will be will fall below the $1.90 level of extreme poverty. The African economy will contract by about $240 billion in, 29, in 2020 due to COVID. And it will take several years for Africa to recover from this blow. Because government revenues decline, the ability of government to provide water, sanitation, education will also decline and instability in Africa will increase. Therefore, instead of reducing the demand for outside assistance in helping to provide and build peace on the continent, the demand is going to increase in the next few years. Countries require decades to escape from the impact of instability. In the work that I do, I look at the structural transformations that are required to transition from a war economy to a peace economy. It takes time. Africa needs to get to its demographic dividend. It needs an agricultural revolution. It needs to industrialize. It needs to use new technology to leapfrog. It needs to implement the African continental free trade area. It needs better governance. And only if all of these things come together, we will see rising prosperity and increased stability on the continent. In that journey, the interna international support and the role of peacekeeping is critical, but it takes decades. And we need to rethink the exit strategies that are all premised on having elections that often are competitive and destroy much of the consensus that has been, been built and to withdraw. It is clear that the nature of peacekeeping in the future is going to change. It already has, particularly as a result of the impact of terrorism, but also because of the declining interest in the provision of peacekeeping support internationally. Already Africans provide the most peacekeepers uh, on the continent. Leadership is often under Africa, but global interest and support is waning. We have to think how we can use new technologies how we can really get local and national leadership behind peacekeeping if we are going to sustain the momentum towards peacekeeping, if we are going to sustain the global interest in peacekeeping at a time that the relevance of the United Nations and its Security Council are being questioned increasingly, particularly by the larger countries. Africans need to take the lead, and they often are, but these challenges and, and resource constraints require innovative new thinking. And I think the Challenges Program, as it has so often in the past, can really bring some of that new thinking uh, to the table. 
thank you for the opportunity to have been able to share a few of my thinking and our work with you and good luck for the rest of the conference. Uh, Dr. Jackie Schillier raised the structural challenges in Africa and how these can drive present and future violent conflicts and consequently increase the need for future peace operations. At the same time as we have a decreasing support, uh, especially for larger peacekeeping missions. Knowing then that the time is running out a bit, I'll ask uh, first Jean-Pierre to very briefly, maximum one minute, to still reflect on um, the issue about, uh, and you heard also the ministers of Norway and, and Indonesia raise this, uh, uh, how can we promote partnership uh, between the UN and regional organizations so that they are sustainable and pre predictable and we could possibly focus on the African Union as it was raised by Dr. Schiller. Please, Jean-Pierre. Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, these uh, uh, intervention by Dr. Schiller highlight the importance of uh, uh, a global approach uh, to the conflict that we're dealing with, uh, an approach that covers all their dimensions, particularly the drivers of conflict and the need for increased partnership. Uh, we're back to that because uh, a peace operation, however multidimensional, has to focus on its key priorities. I believe that most of the time the key priorities are support to political efforts, protection of civilians and building capacities. But building capacities, even something like protection of civilian and political efforts that we cannot do alone. But there are other dimensions to that as well. Um, the uh, political efforts, both at the local national level, require a follow-up with uh, humanitarian and, uh, and development support. Uh, approaching the regional dimension, and particularly when it comes to drivers of conflict, also requires uh, a, a, a concerted approach. Uh, uh, just one example, the herders and farmers conflict, which are often you know, very much uh, triggers or, 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 or uh, issues that fuel conflict. These are issues that are complex. They need to be approached through a coordination of our efforts with the development pillar, with the regional organization and sub-regional organization, uh, with uh, uh, those who can also provide humanitarian support. And, uh, and, and I, I could mention another couple of examples. One is the illegal activities, the criminal activities that fuel armed groups and terrorist groups. This is something that has to be also approached at a more a global level than just a national level, regional and even global level and through partnership. And the last word is who says partnership has to say uh, that we have to uh, make more efforts to ensure that we are as coordinated as possible, that each of the stakeholders uh, bring to the table the, uh, where the, the efforts where they can make the best difference. And I think this is how we can improve uh, our collective uh, efforts to, to deal with these very complex conflicts, particularly in Africa. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. I, 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 what rings in my ears when you talk about regional concerted approach, and that connects also, I think, to the uh, what is at heart, the political uh, process and the political solutions. And I do believe that if you can make these, you talked about uh, uh, alliances before or coalitions, uh, a lot of other things like finances and bureaucratic procedures might fall into place. Uh, but in the absence of those coalitions and political interests, of course, it will always be much more difficult. Sven Erik, would you like to give a, a last pitch before we start closing this session, please? Thank you, Bjorn, and very, very brief. I think it has to do with commitment, political commitment and financial commitment. And uh, I mean, we have talked about the need of multilateral uh, cooperation and organizations, but we need also a commitment for a partnership between our international uh, organizations. And I doubt that we really have the, the commitment, the sustainable commitment uh, over the years for, for cooperation. So I think we, we need to, to improve that. And we need also to improve um, the financial uh, conditions for partnership, for example, between the United Nations and the African Union. And as we all know, many, many years now, we have had a discussion in the Security Council on uh, assessed contributions from the United Nations to fund regional peace operations. And I think it's high time to try to find a solution uh, uh, on that. And finally, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the upcoming Strand 2, Dialogue Strand 2, 
during the, the annual forum hosted by uh, ISS from South Africa. And uh, the theme, uh, the subject of this uh, dialogue strand is exactly on UN AU, AU relations. I'm really, really looking forward to, to listen to that. Thank you. Thank you, Sven Erik. And before I, I thank you, both of you, for, for, for helping and contributing to thoughts on, on these uh, key topics, I'd just like to say to the, uh, those of you following the open sessions of the Challenges Annual Forum, this time virtual, that uh, what follows is a high level conversation on the topic of improving peace operations through using the full spectrum uh, of peace operations, but also on advancing women, peace and security uh, agenda. So we will not stop at talking about that topic now, but continue in the next session. Uh, on Friday, for you, those of you coming back then, we will have a high level discussion on how to ensure the primacy of politics of peace operations in, change, in a changing global landscape. So you see, we are consistent in the choice of our, of our uh, topics and themes. And not to forget for, for all of you uh, being in the open sessions that we have a, a key takeaway session on Friday where you will find uh, the possibility to listen to the key takeaways from the dialogue strands uh, and of course in the formal uh, closing. And, and, and having listened to both of you, and, and thanks a lot, uh, Jean-Pierre and, and Sven-Erik, I think about the words from you, Sven-Erik, saying about sustainable political commitment. And I think that the Challenges Forum, in its informal uh, posture and being uh, uh, having a membership from 50, 23 countries, 50 partners, it's the P5 of the UN Security Council, it's civil society organizations. We are trying to be a part of that multilateral dialogue to sustain political interest in, in, in political solutions to conflict. So thanks to both of you to, uh, for helping us to kick off uh, this first virtual annual forum. And I'm looking forward to having you on board uh, in, the, 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 in the future, soon to be. Uh. Thanks a lot. Thank you.